This is Anarchast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I'm here in Acapulco, Mexico, and I have Debbie Harbison coming in from Southern Illinois, and she's a big proponent of unschooling, and I'm really into this unschooling thing, and I hope you are too, and peaceful parenting, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But before we get into that, let's find out, Debbie, how did you become an anarchist? Um, hi, Jeff. Just one note to begin. It's Southern Indiana. So, oh, sorry, Southern Indiana. Indiana. Sorry. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, let me tell you my story about how I became an anarchist. Um, for me... The root, looking back, I can see the root was a personal experience that I had, uh, most specifically something that happened whenever, you know, after I became a parent, um, I decided to, my kids had started school um, beginning of first and second grade. By that time, I decided that I was going to chuck all that, take them out of school and, and do our own thing. And I found out that that wasn't necessarily as easy as I thought it was going to be. I had my first run in with government. The county I happened to live in um, went uh, past even what the uh, state law said to try and gather information from homeschoolers and I was with a group of people who decided not to comply with that to get this county you know back on back on the, the path again and as part of that I received a we received a letter in the mail, a threatening letter, saying that if we didn't follow and do, if we didn't do what they say, that we would be charged with educational neglect, which was actually a felony. And I thought, really? You're kidding me? You're going to charge me with a felony because I want to keep my kids at home. So I was doing just fine, and suddenly they become compulsory school age, and all of a sudden, you got to watch over me. The worst part about this letter was that I'm sitting there reading it. These are the people telling me that I need to report to them. I need to be tell them that I'm qualified to do this. And there was at least three spelling errors in that letter from um, the prosecutor's office. I circled it in red. And when my husband came home, I said, look at this. We should just mail it right back. And he wisely suggested that we did not do that. <laughs> and so I didn't. But as it, as it turns out, that all kind of got worked out. Um, we didn't have to turn in that information. We moved to a neighboring school district not long after that and uh, we're not bothered again. But that was a very, very difficult time for us or for me to, to, to think that that kind of stuff was happening. I had to worry about that when all I wanted to do was figure out how I was going to educate my own kids. Um, and then on, on the same lines of that, then as I started educating my kids, I started learning more about freedom in that regard and started reading books. Actually, before I homeschooled, I started reading books of a wonderful, wonderful man named by the name of John Holt. He he wrote a he was an education reformer in the 60s and 70s. He finally figured out that schools weren't where it's at, and he started encouraging people to leave school, and not only to leave school itself as the building, but to leave the whole attitude of school. Um, generally, what people are doing now, I mean, we call this now unschooling. He kind of started, some people say he coined the term. I think he may have used the term unschooling first. Um, but as I did that, then I started seeing that, you know, this letting people go, letting them do things the way they're going to do them, that works pretty well. And I was, I was getting a magazine at the time, Home Education Magazine. There was always a very interesting column in there from a couple with their last name, I think, was the Casimans. I don't know if they still write that column, but now, my perspective now, I know that they were writing from a libertarian perspective. Started learning more about this libertarian idea, running into that here or there. Um, ended up joining the Libertarian Party of Indiana. My husband and I even helped it grow. We, uh, we started the local county affiliate down here. Um, I ran an educational campaign for state senate. All those experiences started confirming for me more and more that really that that wasn't going to solve anything either. The interesting thing about being in the parties, I just I just kept on going. I was continuing to learn, read more, try and figure things out, and I kind of started bumping heads with people in the party. There's always if anyone, if you've been in the party, there's this purist pragmatist c debate that's kind of always going on um, and disagreements on how you should run the political party. 
I read Murray Rothbard's book, For a New Liberty, started thinking about things, asking questions, and some of the questions they didn't really, you know, want to hear. Finally, somebody said, just why are you, you know, you're an anarchist. You, you really don't belong here. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> oh, okay, really? And, you know, I started <laughs> thinking, learning, and reading more. I found a non-voting archive on a site called Strike the Root. I remember very clearly reading something I found there. I'm pretty sure I found it there, uh, written by George Smith called Party Dialogue. And it was, I guess, kind of a dialogue between, a, I guess, an anarchist person, a purist, and that person well versed in the political part of the Libertarian Party. And it really struck me. And for, ever, for whatever reason, some people stick, they find a party and that's what they need. But it just still, things still just didn't come to, into play for me or make sense. From there, I found a site called uh, voluntarius.com, um, a great site that Carl Watner runs. As a matter of fact, um, that got started in the early 1980s, and one of the people that helped Carl start that was Wendy McElroy, who is somebody that you've had on this uh, Anarchist, by the way. Carl is still keeping it up. He, he does, um, I think he still sends out his monthly newsletter. He's still writing and thinking about those sorts of things. I did a project with him not, not too long ago. Um, and I guess I've always been, I would have to say, I've always been more comfortable saying I'm a voluntarist as opposed to I'm an anarchist because we all know how the language is, is being defined these days. But it's really cool to see people, more and more people, as the Internet expands, just coming out and saying, you know, whatever, I'm an anarchist. It's, yeah. Or you say you're a voluntarist, what does that mean? Does that mean anarchy? Well, yeah, it does. Um, so anyway, that's kind of, of the, path, the path that I took. And it really, for me, I would have to say started with uh, realizing that if there's freedom in education, if I'm so big about just totally getting government out of that, why doesn't it work for anything? So I simply just took my personal experience and applied it on a universal basis. That's great. And yeah, the word anarchy, of course, has been uh, totally uh, misused or uh, manipulated over time. Uh, the government, the media always like to say whenever anyone breaks a window at a Starbucks that it was anarchists or if a bomb went off somewhere, it was an anarchist. Uh, they may have been anarchists, but it usually isn't. It usually is communists uh, who call themselves anarcho-communists, anarcho uh, which uh, is another totally uh, doesn't even exist in reality. There's no difference between an anarcho-communist and a communist, so just get rid of the word anarchy uh, and uh, leave us alone with that word. And we're trying to bring that word back, and it's, it's going fairly well so far. And, uh, and uh, as far as your progression, yeah, it's really uh, uh, brought you down that road once you got a letter from the government saying that they basically owned your kids. Right. <laughs> so I can totally see how you went down that road. So let's talk about unschooling. So how many children do you have? Uh, I have two. A boy and a girl. Okay. They are now um, 28 and 29. Okay. Do they have their own children now? Uh, they're both married, and my daughter is growing my first grandchild as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> growing her. That's great. And uh, so when did you take them out of the public schools? My daughter was just beginning second grade, and my son was just beginning first grade. I was saw problems when my daughter was in first grade, but still just trying to, you know, thinking other things were going on or whatever and continuing, you know, I learned myself a little more about homeschooling and stuff, which, by the way, I met someone before the kids even went in school who said that they were going to, that they were homeschooling, and I thought that was a very strange thing to do, and it was probably less than four years later that I was right in there doing the same thing. So they were in for a little while, but not for long and then they um they went all the way through high school uh at home yes so you you actually homeschooled them the whole way pardon you actually homeschooled them you didn't totally unschool them oh they were they were uh basically unschooled like i said i learned about john holt as i was starting so um as I wrangled out of all of my brainwashing, I tried my best to give them the freedom that, that they needed to learn and grow. And as my husband and I saw how well it worked, then we continued along that line. So, um, yeah, they were, they were unschooled. I have actually a little book that I wrote, a little humor book that I wrote, kind of talking about some of our early homeschooling experiences as I was trying to implement more freedom 
into our whole family's life. That's great. So you, you were way ahead of the curve because I just heard about unschooling just a few months ago. So uh, did you actually know what you were doing was unschooling or were you just following your own intuitions? Well, everything, everything that I was doing was based on the information that I was gathering mostly from John Holt and the resources that he had. Right, right at that time was when, this was um, the very early 90s, we just started getting connected on this new thing called the internet and this new thing called message boards. Uh, my first, first thing we got on was something called Prodigy, I think, and started to connect with people um, just outside of my, my normal circle. As a matter of fact, I didn't know I didn't know anybody locally. I found some people who were homeschooling, but they were very, very traditional. They were pretty much just sitting at the table with a box curriculum and doing quote school at home, which is not what we wanted to do. So, um, and then I think even back then, I kind of was aware that there was that term going around that 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 was unschooling. That what we were doing was was unschooling. Oh, that's great. I know you call it educational anarchy. Yeah. And uh, why don't you explain to people who are, who are new to this and who maybe have some children in their lives uh, what, uh, what they should be doing or what, what you would uh, uh, advise them to do as far as unschooling or how to go about it or, or first of all, how to get them out of school and then, and then where do they go from there? Well, let's see. If you have kids in school right now, um, unfortunately, you need to be a little careful depending on what state you're in. You have to, you know, jump through certain hoops and maybe do certain steps, and that's very dependent on the state. But there's so much information out there now that that um, people are out there ready to help you get that step done. Um, you can homeschool slash unschool in, in um, every state in the United States, so it's possible to get them out. Um, Let's see the second part. Like, what you know, you've got them out of school. What do you do then? That's that's right. that's the, you know the thing that just scares everybody to death. I like right. I like to have people. Uh, first thing I like to do is have them think about how they felt about the kids before they became that magical government compulsory school age, and how they thought about their education and learning, or even as an infant. I mean. We don't sit there and worry a whole lot about whether our kids are going to learn or how they're going to learn how to walk and talk. They want, they are naturally curious. They want to do that. They want to get to the toy that's on the other side of the room and they're going to learn how to crawl and to walk and to get that. It's, that's the essence of it, their curiosity and their interests. And we don't sit there and write down this whole curriculum or sit them somewhere and say, okay, here's exactly what you want to do. Oh, no, you need to do this first. Do they all, they all do it, they all do it differently. My daughter, as a matter of fact, had a very funny, she never did crawl. She kind of sat up and sat on her butt and would take her feet and use her feet and push her butt up to her feet and do it again until she kind of got across the room and then you know and then she eventually moved to walking and think about this way too I like to go back to the that core that when your child's learning to walk you know and they're still unsteady what do you do do you what do parents and people around them normally do they might just stand uh, mostly stand behind them let them take the lead put your fingers out like this so they can grab and then you know they just learn to walk and you are the you're just there as as a facilitator. You're just helping them literally go. Think of this as a metaphor. You're just helping them literally go where they want to go. You, your fingers and your balance behind them is just there to help them accomplish what they want to accomplish. You're not in front of them telling them, oh, no, or, or moving them around saying, oh, no, you need to go this way. You need to do this. It's important for you to learn to learn this or to go to, to this toy, not that one. You just don't think about things like that. But we've got schools there. And we've all been brainwashed on. And we think, oh, my gosh, my, my kindergartner can't really, doesn't quite know his ABCs yet. He's, he's going to be a failure in life. He'll never learn how to read. It, that's all, that's all just, just bunk. They... They want the reading and those types of all of those types of things are things that kids 
see that are valuable and they'll want to learn how to do them if they have some thing going on with them that there's a struggle and I'm not convinced that that happens I think that that we don't know that I would love to see some studies done on that even like in regards to reading and stuff we think we have to get these kids really earlier and earlier now and teach them how to read but they're just not ready yet there you'll hear from unschoolers with a wide I mean a huge range of people I mean of ages of where their child started to learn to read or to really even care about it and get into reading and the young ones who pick it up fast well whatever they do it they go read these books the other ones if they're they you know they're just immersed in family life and the literate environment and books are around and some of them are late you know nine ten years old when they get a little interested in it and heard even older and they decide oh they're gonna learn how to read it's it's no big deal they're just ready they've got the reason for it and their brain is ready and they go out and do it my son's an example of that too he wasn't interested in the stuff that was going on in in first grade he he just wanted to be outside and and do things that he thought was interesting not sit there and recite the stuff this was a funny story too he this teacher happened to think it was a good idea when she taught them things that well they would just recite it back you know like I don't know let's just say one plus one is two two plus two is four whatever that would be and he learned he figured out that if he was a little I guess he wasn't totally careful because he eventually got caught but he figured out that if he just when she did that if he just moved his mouth <laughs> that she would kind of leave him alone and she found she finally caught him and he got in trouble or, you know, they told us about it. And we asked him about it and he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and he said, I don't know, I just figured out if if I just sat there like that and moved my mouth, she would just leave me alone and my brain could get, start continue to think about the stuff that, that I wanted to think about. And I thought that was brilliant, frankly. Yeah, I was very much similar in school. I actually went all the way through it, but I pretty much didn't go much after about grade nine. I did a deal with my mom to just go for the tests, and I'd just go, and the morning of the tests, I'd just read the textbook, and I'd, I'd retain enough information to pass, and I, I realized it was really just a waste of my time. I, I'd much rather be on my computer at home, hacking away, learning how to program, things that I were interested in. And uh, it's funny you brought up at the very start, uh, curiosity. I recently saw a graphic uh, that showed uh, that uh, they asked uh, school-aged children uh, all the way up to high school uh, how curious they are in general. And it starts almost like at 100%. Uh, by grade six, it's down to about 60%. And it just keeps going down, down, down until finally they're barely curious at all because they've just had all the curiosity driven out of them by this forced education of things that at that moment in time they probably didn't care about or if they did that's fine but that's pretty rare and uh, yeah it's just a terrible system this is exactly right they don't they don't or the system's just not set up I think there's people in there who care okay but the system does not care what the individual child is interested in cares about what they're supposed to dump inside that child's brain and the act of doing that com completely eliminates being able to to treat the child as an individual and say, oh, what are you interested, you know, what you can do at home with unschooling is take the, your child's interest and just, just find all the resources you can and offer it to them. If they, if they take one, fine. If they don't, fine. And they will just, they will just run with it. And they, again, they'll learn how to read. They learn how to write. They learn around how to do all of that stuff because those are just tools in, for them to be able to learn or do the thing that they happen to be interested in. It, it, it works. It really does. Yeah, it totally does. I've seen it myself and uh, I have a son, he's eight years old, and I'm actually glad to hear that uh, some people start reading later than others because he still doesn't read very well. Uh, but uh, interestingly, he's, he's incredibly good with languages. He speaks, he was born in Germany, so he speaks fluent German. He moved here to Mexico uh, about two years ago. He's now almost completely fluent in Spanish and I was just on a Skype call with my mom the other day and I thought I'd have to translate for him but he understood and answered almost everything she said in English I didn't even know he spoke English he's just been picking it up That's awesome. it's just amazing yeah and uh, the uh, as far as um, learning to read he loves video games and he, he's just so immersed in all these environments and he's always so excited about how he found a way to win that game or that other game but every now and then he, he calls me into the room and he says, can you tell me what this says? Because, you know, I can't read it all. 
And, you know, I always just drop a little hint. It's like, oh, it's just too bad. You can't read yet. Like, you could, there'd be so much more you could do with these games. And he's like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm close. And I know as well from uh, him swimming. We have a pool here. I'm sitting right beside my pool. And uh, he said, I can't swim. I can't swim. I was, I was always like, that's fine. Whatever. And one day, he was just swimming like a dolphin. He's like, like, he just snapped like he he was just ready at that point in time and he he had picked up some of the tips i'd given him and you know you don't have to force them to do these things that, that they want to do them. yeah that's funny too that's what i was uh forgot to add with my son after i told that story that when we when we got home my daughter voracious reader at a very young age she just devoured book after book my son wasn't wasn't that interested he like i said he'd rather rather be taking apart my toaster and figuring out how that worked than than picking up a book but later i don't even know exactly how it happened you know but sometime later he got more interested in in reading and books and he just started he just started reading books and and he had no problem uh, moving I mean, we didn't do anything in special and you know you mean they both chose to go to college and he had no problem with the reading that he had to do. That was all fine. There's another story about how they learn things so so easily. We I never bothered with um, cursive. I mean, actually, my daughter, see, it's another thing. If they're interested, fine. If they're not, fine. It didn't matter that my son was not interested in it. My daughter thought cursive and stuff was pretty cool. It was an art to her, and we picked up a calligraphy book, and she did calligraphy. And he, my son was just ah, fooey on all that. Suddenly, when he became 13, he came up to me and he said, you know, I think I want to learn how to write write cursive. And I said, well, okay. I said, why do you want to do that, though? We can we can do that. He goes, well, someday I might become pretty famous and people are going to want my autograph, so I'm going to have to write my signature. <laughs> so we went to, this time we just went to Walmart or something, and we got these little books, this book on cursive. He was, I just gave it to him. He went in his room and... I, I know this because, I mean, I kept a journal at the time, you know, and three weeks later he came out and said, well, I'm done. You know, he he, he learned cursive and he, he learned it at least as, as well. He learned what he needed to learn when he wanted to learn it, and it was no big deal. I didn't even have to do anything but go out and get the little, you know, book that he could copy out from, so... Yeah, once they're ready, the learning happens so fast, but if they're not ready and they don't want to learn it, all of a sudden it becomes almost like a prison and then they almost rebel. And that's actually a big thing you hear from so many people. It's, oh, my child's rebelling. Well, I don't think unschooling children could rebel. There'd be nothing to rebel against. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also interesting, too, that um, uh, I, I, I personally find self-defense to be very important. I think everyone should know a little bit of how to defend themselves. I think it's one of the most basic things. And of course, that's not taught in, in school. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I have a Kung Fu uh, trainer come by about once a week for the kids. And uh, uh, my son doesn't like it too much, but he does it because I, I told him, I said, I think it's important. He's like, OK, if you think it's important, I'll do it. But my daughter really loves it. Like she just pounds the mitts. She's only six years old. And so the other day, the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, uh, had the first women's uh, world championship on. So I, I recorded it and I, I played it for her and she was just mesmerized. She's like, that's what this Kung Fu stuff is? And I'm like, yeah, that's basically what it is. And she was just, wow, this is amazing. So yeah, they're just so open to stuff when they're open to it. But to try to force them is the exact wrong thing to do. I even like what, what you said your son said, like, you know, oh, this isn't, a, I don't know what I think about this. and. And you just told him what you thought, that you thought it was important. I'm like, oh, well, if you think it's important. I mean, that just says a lot about, you know, the relationship that, that you're setting up, that, you know, you're not just going to make him sit down. He, he, you've already set something up that he's just thinking, well, you're not going to make me sit down and do some really stupid stuff. There must be some reason why you think this is important. So what the heck, I'll give it a try. So it's that kind of back and forth, respectful relationship that's a big part of unschooling, too. Yeah, it's a lot of trust, and he's seen that I've said many things in the past, like, hey, you might want to learn how to read, and you'll enjoy <laughs> these games more, and, and he understands, and he, he can see that I'm giving him uh, advice that, that probably will help him in his life, so he's open to, to me giving him some suggestions, but I never force yes. him to do anything. I just say, give it a try, though, you know, just give it a try, you know, try everything once, and he's like, okay, I'll try it, but he's not too into it, but like I said, my daughter really is. Um, so, so your uh, kids are all grown up now, and uh, they, went, they both went to college? Yeah. They did. And so what was their thoughts on college after being unschooled most of their life? <laughs> Boy, you know, that's really probably a question best asked of them. But 
they did have you know a lot of interesting stories or things to say about it. The most interest, the most uh, eye-opening thing for them was to go to college and to see all of the kids there. They just said, "Mom, they they don't really care about like." Like, I took this class because I want to actually know what this is about. <laughs> and they're just asking the professors, like, what? okay, what's going to be on the test? What do I need to know? <laughs> what do I need need to do? And that was completely foreign to them that you would just, that that. Actually want to that learn. That was what education <laughs> meant to the those kids. But to my kids, it's like, okay, I want I want to learn about about this. <laughs> piece whatever it is and there's things that they had to do that were frankly just jumping through hoops but the thing about both of my kids is being unschooled they knew that if they wanted to to go to college that there were going to be some hoops that they had to jump through and do some things that they might not want to do but you know for whatever reasons they decided to go ahead and jump through those hoops in order to you know go to college so and I assume they both wanted to go to college, uh, of course, so you wouldn't have just put them in college. No, I was actually saying, I don't even know if you really need to do that. And my, my husband wasn't quite quite so sure about that. So they have, you know, you have the combination of, of a lot of different things for each individual family and each individual. Yeah, and there's so many resources out there now. Anything you want to learn is on the internet. Uh, but if you do want to go, go ahead, go. Uh, but it's definitely not uh, something necessary, like uh, it's published and, and propagate, propagandized in, in the U.S. Well, so much has changed even now. I mean, even in that, in that shorter time period, you know, if, my, if both of the kids were what, 15 years younger, it would be interesting to see what kind of decisions they would make. Because you're right, it just boomed. I mean, there's so many, so many things out there, so many ways to do things. Only thing that bothers me now about college degrees and, and encouraging people to not do it. I mean, it, the only thing that bothers me about it is there are so many things out there that someone might want to do that a college degree is used as another checkbox uh, of something that you need to have in order to do it. It's become, it, it can be kind of a barrier. I like that a lot of people in unschooling now start talking to more about, you know, entrepreneurship, doing your own thing. And I mean, both of my kids were very, very busy doing that kind of thing in, in high school too. They did all, you know, some of the traditional type things, you know, babysitting, mowing lawns, um, um, doing those sorts of things. My daughter laughs. We have a, a being home, being homeschoolers, we lived in a neighborhood with a lot of young kids that all very, very busy doing a lot of babysitting. And she did a whole lot for one particular family. And at the point, I don't know how she, how she was. I mean, maybe it was when she was 16 and got her license. But um, my husband took her out and they found a car. And she used her babysitting money to pay cash for her first car. And, and she drove it over to the neighbor's house to show it to him and said, look at this. I said, I just want to thank you guys for helping me get my first car because that's where she gets the cash from to do it so wow that's great and uh, my kids are still quite young but i'm really looking forward to when they get a little older and i'm going to really sort of not push them but give them a bit of direction as to becoming entrepreneurs uh you know the school system is mostly made as you know to train workers uh, and train them to cut show up at nine in the morning leave at five and don't ask questions and mostly just uh you know trains people to blindly obey things and so I'm really looking forward to that and recently my daughter asked she we have an iPad and, and she wanted this one uh, app on the iPad and it cost two dollars and I said to her okay I'll, I'll get that but you, you owe me two dollars now and she just looked at me like really and like she's like how am I gonna get two dollars I'm like well you're gonna have to figure out something some way to make some money yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you know her, her mind started you know you could see the little gears spinning and uh, and I'm sure in a year or two or whenever it is uh, she'll probably uh, just come up with something and say hey I found out how to make some money <laughs> yeah and both of my kids too they're you know they're doing the things they're doing they, you know there's pros and cons to having you know some jobs like like husband, he had he had his own business while they were growing up, and and they're doing the things they're doing now. But I can tell they're constantly thinking and figuring out and talking to him, reaching for that one day when they maybe just decide that they, you know, there is something they're going to do on their own or that they might be able to do, and they just consider some of what they're doing now just building up different experiences that will 
you know, build on everything else that they might do. So who knows? Who knows where they end up? It's just really fun watching everything that they do. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, as far as jobs, some people might be watching and, and thinking, well, if we do it, if everyone does this, there'll be no workers. Well, no, I think there is a, a role for jobs. I've had dozens of jobs in my life. Of course, when you're younger, you don't have much experience and that's a good way to gain experience. But I think a lot of people think of a job as, uh, you know, a thing for life and they're just going to work there for 40 right. years. And that's fine. If they want to do that, that's totally fine. And some people just don't have the aptitude or personality or whatever you want to say, characteristics uh, to create their own things or to become some sort of private contractor in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, but uh, definitely we could use more people like that. And, so, and, and we're definitely not getting them out of, the, out of the school system. Almost everyone who graduates college, if you ask them, okay, now what are you going to do? And the first thing is I'm, I want to get a job. It's, it's not even on, on their mind to uh, try to create something on their own, their own private business, even if it's just one person, a private contractor, they just haven't been uh, uh, it, you know, educated on those sort of ideas and, and ways of doing things. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, this has been very interesting. It's a lot for people to think about, and so we'll let them think about it. And uh, do you have a, a link to your book that people can buy or any other links you want to mention? You know, I have several resources for homeschoolers that I just have available for free. I have a website that's just my name, debbieharbison.com. That's D-E-B-B-I-E-H-A-R-B-E-S-O-N.com. I have a, you can find a link to my book there. I have a couple videos that I have on there that I did. I did a talk on unschooling at uh, Libertopia one year, and I did another little unschooling talk on um, something called Agora I.O., um, that was done online. Really, that whole thing was kind of a very cool unschooling way of, of doing things. And then that letter I told you about that I got from uh, from the prosecutor's office, I kept that and I have that on my site. I've turned that negative thing for me into what I hope is a positive for other people. You can I call it now my ultimate homeschooling encouragement. And so that link's on, on there as well. And, and uh, so I like send people there and tell them, you what, do you think you can't, you homeschool or you think you need the government looking over your shoulder? Go check this out and tell me what, then tell me what you think. So all of that, you can get to all that from there. Okay, we'll try to put as many links as possible and people have a lot of homework to do if they want to do it. We won't force them to do it. And uh, so yeah, that's another addition to Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy.